Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. This session is why durability matters and lifetime management considerations for Sapra Anra Taba. This session is sponsored by Medtonic. I am Shigeru from Kamakura, Japan. Today, uh, we have distinguished uh, moderators and discussants. First, I would introduce distinguished remote moderator Roy from Sydney, Australia. And the two distinguished remote discussants, Shinichi from Kita Kyushu, Japan, and Russ from Copenhagen, Denmark. In Japan, Tabi was formally introduced in clinical field in 2012. Just almost 10 years have passed in our Tabi experience. During these years, the device itself, implantation techniques, knowledge, how to manage the patients, and etc., have evolved. Still, we have remaining issues related to small body sized Asian patients, Japanese people, Japanese patients. This session was constructed in order to highlight the following uh, topics considering these situations. The first, if you want to review the clinical data evolution from extremely high risk to low risk patients. If you want to learn about the latest evolved low risk trial result. Third, if you want to discuss the lifetime management consideration for long term low risk patients, especially for Asian patients, Japanese patients. Let's join this session. Okay. Please. And today we have Japanese native speaking chat master Tomoki from Kamakura, Japan. Anytime, anybody, anything, please freely and easily communicate with Tomoki through chats, especially in English, but we accommodate Japanese as well. So be free. Okay. So now uh, I want to move to the uh, presentation by Roy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Roy. I'm an interventional cardiologist from St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. And it's my great pleasure to speak here at Tokyo Valves about the evolution of clinical data for TAVI from extreme risk to low risk patients. We're very fortunate in structural cardiology to have a breadth of high quality randomized controlled data uh, in the field of TAVI. And for high, with high risk patients, we have the core valve pivotal study and the partner study that have both shown very good outcomes when compared to surgery. For the high risk core valve pivotal study, TAVI was actually superior to surgery at one year and at two years and all the way up to five years TAVI compares very favorable with surgery. And, and that's very reassuring for us when we think about the, the durability of the devices we're using. For the intermediate risk patients, there are three high quality randomized control trials. Two of them were with uh, self-expanding platforms and the partner three and the Sir Tavi study both um, showed very good outcomes when comparing to surgery. For the Sir Tavi study, this did show non-inferiority when compared to surgery. And this was the first big interventional study to use the Bayesian method of statistics, which proved to be very accurate in predicting the two-year outcomes. So for TAVI versus surgery, TAVI was non-inferior in the primary composite outcome or outcome of all-cause mortality or disabling stroke. 
um, and of interest, while we had some scare that there might be higher stroke rate in our high-risk patients from the partner studies, this study actually showed that all stroke was actually statistically lower uh, for TAVI than it was for surgery. One point of difference in the Sotavi study was the hemodynamic outcomes, and at all follow-up time points, there was a, a statistically significant difference uh, in terms of the hemodynamic outcomes when comparing TAVI to surgery, and this may prove to be a point of difference in the future. So for our low-risk patients, we're really lucky in this um, field now that we have evidence for all the risk groups and one of our panellists here, Professor Lars Sondergaard, actually was the PI in the Notion trial, but we've also got the Partner 3 trial and we've got the Evolute Low Risk Study, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. Remember that when talking about these studies for the randomised controlled trials, some of the devices that were used in these studies have already been superseded by uh, devices with more modern iterations and all of us who are doing TAVI are actually expecting better outcomes for our patients um, in the contemporary era. So the Evolut Low Risk Study randomised patients and actually enrolled 1,414 patients with severe trileaflet aortic stenosis who had a 30-day surgical mortality of less than 3%. When 850 patients had reached their 12-month follow-up, the primary endpoint of death or disabling stroke at 24 months was evaluated initially using this Bayesian statistical method. But we're now at a point where we actually have completed the two-year follow-up, and these are the, the outcomes for the two-year Evolute Low Risk Trial. The majority of the, the centres were in the US, um, but of course, because it's Tokyo Vows, I think it's important to point out that seven of these centres for the Low Risk Study were from Japan, and we were also one of the enrolling sites at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, Australia. There are not a lot of differences between the two patient groups. Slightly more patients withdrew from the surgical arm as, as we would expect, um, but there was very good follow-up uh, completed at two years. You can see for the one-year composite outcome of all-cause mortality and disabling stroke, there was a numerically lower number when comparing TAVI versus surgery um, that did not quite meet statistical significance. Interestingly, out to two years, this benefit is maintained. And you can see with the Kaplan-Meier curves there, there's actually no convergence of these curves. And some of that early benefit is maintained all the way through to two years with no great change. And the primary outcome of all-cause mortality or disabling stroke um, again, numerically favours TAVI. If you separate these outcomes into mortality, again, at one year and, and two years, numerically, it favours TAVI. And again, with disabling stroke, at one year and two years, numerically favouring TAVI. So what about comparing the Bayesian predicted outcome with the actual outcomes? Well, these turned out to be very accurate. And in fact, if anything, they overestimated the composite endpoint and death and disabling stroke was actually sl slightly less than expected. As expected, there was a higher permanent pacemaker uh, noted in the TAVI population compared with surgery. However, I think a lot of us who are implanting Evolute valves have switched over to the cusp overlap technique where globally we're expecting pacemaker rates in single digits and we're about to publish our first 200 patients of cusp overlap where we've got a pacemaker rate of 7.7%. I'd like to point out also the valve thrombosis here, and you see that these are really very low numbers in terms of risk of valve thrombosis, and there's no difference between surgery and the TAVI devices with this um, self-expanding platform. Again, the hemodynamics are, are really vastly superior when we compare a self-expanding platform with a supraannular valve to a surgical valve, and this is for all follow-up points out to two years. For PVL, there's a very small difference favouring surgery. I think we could expect that, but certainly less than 2% of patients at two years are ending up with moderate PVL. But interestingly, there is a significant increase in patients with patient prosthesis mismatch um, with almost 25% of patients in the surgical arm having some element of this at two years. 
When we compare the results of the Evolute low-risk trial to the two-year outcomes for the Sapien 3 low-risk study, you can see that some of that benefit at one year is actually uh, lost at two years. And you can see the curves, the Kaplan-Meier curves are actually converging. Why is that? Well, Marty Leon earlier in the year commented that the initial differences in death and stroke following TAVI were diminished and patients who underwent TAVI with a balloon expandable valve had increased levels of valve thrombosis. And you can see in the table on the right there, there's actually a significantly increased 2.6% rate of um, valve thrombosis at two years when compared to surgery. That may be one of the reasons. The other reason I think that all of us are aware of is the hemodynamics and with a, a balloon expandable valve at 30 days and at one year, surgery actually provides a, a superior hemodynamic outcome to a balloon expandable valve. These are some of the results from the Choice Extend registry. And you can see the difference between a, a self-expanding Evolute platform and a Sapien device. And there are superior hemodynamic outcomes across all valve sizes. And this is a, a statistically significant finding. I think in the long term, this may be important. In the short term, nobody's expecting to see a mortality difference at one year with small differences in hemodynamics. But over time, you know, I think a lot of us are expecting uh, these numbers to bear out in the data. And this is a study from Australia that showed that in over 200,000 patients, just a small difference in uh, or increase in gradient actually did lead to a significant increase in mortality over time. So to summarise, the two-year Evolute low-risk study um, demonstrated that TAVI was non-inferior to surgery with regards to death or disabling stroke at two years. The Kaplan-Meier rates were slightly better than predicted for the Bayesian analysis at two years. There was no convergence of the primary outcome curves for TAVI and surgery between years one and two, and this really does show that the, the valve is continuing to perform well over time. Surgery was superior to TAVI in terms of new pacemakers and greater than mild PVL. And TAVI was superior to surgery with regards to hemodynamics and patient prosthesis mismatch. There's no difference in valve leaflet thrombosis between TAVI and surgery. So now when we think of our heart team decisions for all of these risk groups, we've really moved from things that we used to consider for extreme risk patients, high risk patients, and even intermediate risk patients where we were worried about the procedural outcome. Would the patient have a stroke or what was the mortality risk going to be? What would their immediate benefit in quality of life be and, and would they need a pacemaker? Really, nowadays we have to think a little bit more broadly for our low-risk patients when making these decisions. How long is the patient going to live? What is the durability of the valve going to be? And what's the life expectancy of the valve and the patient together? Hemodynamics have suddenly become very important, as has patient prosthesis mismatch. And of course, coronary access will also play into our decisions for patients in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Roy, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you are fantastic. No, uh, Roy kindly presented and uh, summarized the evolution of the data for clinical trial uh, in Taba and uh, uh, Saba comparison, especially uh, focusing on the uh, core valve or evolute self-expandable supra annular valve system. And uh, looking at the high risk trial data on valve expandable valve, TAVI result is better outcome in two years but similar at five years compared to SABA. Because on the low risk trials for balloon expandable and self-expandable supraannular devices, TAVI can provide better survival and low stroke rate compared to SABA at one year. But this uh, superiority disappears at two years for balloon expandable valve implantation. And this may be due to higher incidence of thrombosis in balloon expandable valve 
compared to the uh, self-expandable valve implantation. And uh, regarding the uh, pacemaker implantation, the introduction of cusp overlap technique contributes to lowering pacemaker rates during uh, this trial conduction. And also choice extended registry shows supra annular valve shows better hemodynamic and slightly improvement in hemodynamics may contribute to the better long-term outcomes. So, so I want to ask, how do you think these data contributes to the, especially Asian patients? You know, Asian patients has, uh, uh, have small body size. Of, of course, the, the size of the artery is also small and the annular size is small, but the, in general, Asian pe people live longer compared to the Western people. How do you think the, 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 these data shown by Roy affect the bulb choice? Roy? Can you yeah. make any comment? Um, thank you, Professor Saito. I, I, I think it's important for, for all people receiving TAVI, of course, to have not only a perfect sort of procedural result and get safely off the table, but now, particularly when we're looking at low-risk patients, to have durability with your valve. And I think it, it's an easy um assumption to put together that the most important factor of durability is actually the hemodynamics and therefore if patients have very very low gradients then we expect that valve to last longer and for patients with small anatomy that that point matters even more if you have small anatomy and therefore risk much much higher risk of patient prosthesis mismatch then having a lower post procedural gradient is essential if, if we think that valve is going to last for a long time and particularly for the Asian population where we are expecting these patients to live a lot longer than maybe some of the patients in the trials where this data comes from. Okay. And uh, Russ, you are, you yeah, are I... from uh, Copenhagen and in Copenhagen again, you have many Asian people living. So... <coughs> How much you are yeah. uh, considering this issue? Okay. I, I think as we're going to move, we discussed that several times to patients with longer life expectancy. We have to take these long-term consequences into consideration. There are several target platforms available, particularly in Europe, and they only all have different um, features. So I think you have to look at each individual patient. Is it a patient with heart failure where you do not want a permanent pacemaker? Is it a patient with pre-existing coronary artery disease where you want to make sure you can access the coronary arteries? Is it a patient with a small aortic annulus where you've foreseen uh, a risk for a patient prestige mismatch and early valve deterioration? I think you have to look at all these features. As an again, as you said, particularly in the Asian population where we know that the risk of patient prestige mismatch is going to be high if you do not choose the right valve. This is certainly something you have to have a high priority in your decision from which valve you're going to, to select. Patient prestige mismatch is going to turn into early valve deterioration, and it's also going to be related with increased cardiac mortality. So this is certainly a very important topic uh, when you treat these uh, patients with longer life expectancy. Okay, thank you very much. How about the Shinichi? Uh, in Japan, what, what kind of approach are you taking to reduce yeah, the, you. Uh, you know, the PPM or something? Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, fortunately, the Japanese patient is a small size patient, so the BSA is low. So maybe the PPM rate is uh, very, very low. But the uh, as the Dr. Lass and the Dr. Roy said, the 
uh, mean pressure gradient and, and uh, hemodynamic status affects the long-term uh, valve durability. So, and uh, we usually see the uh, not the PPM, but the uh, we saw the uh, beam pressure gradient and the maximum velocity. So maybe it uh, it affects the uh, the long-term uh, durability of the valve. So, and the uh, some patients have a, a very very high gradient and the uh, in and because of the valve thrombosis in earlier phase in uh, binary expandable valve, but I think the uh, we choose the self-expandable valve because of the low rate of the valve thrombosis uh, in uh, uh, in Japanese patient. Okay, thank you very much. Hmm. But uh, you know, uh, my question is that sometimes the patient has very you know fatty and uh, heavy body weight. And in that case, the uh, annular size is fixed, so that the if we take the uh, <coughs> some regular sized valve, then the the patient has definitely PPM. In this case, uh, what kind of treatment uh, you take, uh, so Roy? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that can be challenging sometimes when the, the patient um, clearly has an increased BMI and we take that into account. That affects the calculation of the body surface area. But I think, you know, we like to imagine our patients as slim and really the, the patient prosthesis mismatch is more the ideal weight rather than the, the weight you have in front of you on the table. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for nice discussions. Uh, I will move to the uh, next speaker. Russ, he, he will present. You, you can. Uh, you are ready, Russ, for the presentation, please. So thank you for the invitation to talk about hemodynamic and durability of biostatic aortic valves. These are my potential conflicts of interest. So we recently saw the new American guidelines uh, try to uh, tell us how to manage patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. And for younger patients, patients below 65 years of age, these patients should go for surgery. And for elderly patients above 80 years of age, ITAVI should be the first option. And then we have the very difficult group between 65 and 80 years. And what should be taken into consideration is both the patient's life expectancy and the durability of these biprostatic aortic valves. So what do we know about durability? We know that one factor which is going to affect it is the patient prestige mismatch. And that means that if you have severe patient prestige mismatch, that a patient will receive a too small valve for he or her body. And these are the numbers here. So if you get below 0.65 square centimeter per square meter, you have severe patient prestige mismatch. Between 0.65 and 0.85, it's moderate. And more than 0.85, you have insignificant patient prestige mismatch. There has been a discussion whether this actually had any impact uh, on, for the patient. But there's this meta-analysis showing that if you have patient prestige mismatch, the risk of having valve dysfunction is doubled. And not only that, it's also going to affect the life expectancy for the patients. So you see here, patients with moderate patient prestige mismatch have a about one third increased risk of cardiac mortality. And if the patient had severe PPM, it's more than a six fold increase in cardiac mortality. So how can we avoid patient prestige mismatch? Of course, we need to identify the patient who at risk, patient with small aortic anally, but also when we want to treat this patient, try to treat the patient with a transcatheter heart valve, which is providing the largest opening area and the smallest risk of patient prostate mismatch. We recently saw the two low-risk trials, the PARTNER3 and the EVOLUTE low-risk. The PARTNER3 was using the Sapien treat valve, which is a balloon expandable valve with intra annular leaflet position. Whereas in the Evolute low risk, it was the Evolute platform, a self-expanding technology with a super annular leaflet position. And we also know that these valves provide different hemodynamics. 
So on the left hand side, you see uh, from the partner tree with the sapien valve, the balloon expandable valve, that patient treated with that valve had exactly the same rate of severe patient prestige mismatch as patient undergoing surgery. Close to 10% of the patient had severe PPM. On the other hand, on the right hand side, we see patients treated with the Evolut platform, a much lower rate, around 1%, having patient, severe patient prestige mismatch. So sure, it makes a difference what kind of valve you treat these patients with. And also, if you look at whether it's going to turn into to durability of this valve, we have now data on that. The notion trial was conducted very early on between 2009 and 2013, randomizing patients above 80, 70 years of age to TAVI using the first generation core valve or surgical aortic valve replacement. And we now got eight years follow-up data. And what we can see if you look at all cause mortality, even though this was the first generation core valve very early in the program with learning experience and also without need uh, use of CT scan, we see at eight years, the all cause mortality rate is the same for transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement. And also we can see about half of the patient is still alive. So you're going to give us a chance to look of dur on durability. And how to define durability? We have the European consensus report dividing into valve dysfunction and valve failure. Looking at valve dysfunction may be the most important part is structural valve deterioration. And in these European guidelines, this is defined as you have a mean gradient of at least 20 millimeter mercury or a step up in mean gradient of at least 10 millimeter mercury from baseline or at least moderate intravalvular regurgitation. You may say this is not accounting for patient with patient prestige mismatch because if you start out with a high gradient, you only need a, need a small increase before you actually meet this criteria. Therefore, you can have these modified criteria saying that the patient both needs to have a mean gradient of at least 20 millimeter mercury, as well as a step up of mean gradient of at least 10 millimeter mercury from baseline. And if you apply that on the notion data with the core valve, you see at eight years, the rate of structural valve deterioration is only the half, 14% for patient undergoing TAVI with the core valve compared to 28% for the surgical cohort. And that also the same pattern if you use these modified criteria to get rid of patients who have a patient prestige mismatch, 16% for surgical cohort and only 9% for the TAVI cohort. We also have data from the partner two using the Sapien platform. And here you see the opposite finding. Patient undergoing TAVI have a much higher rate of structural valve deterioration, 10% compared to only 3% in the surgical group. So certainly valve design makes a difference on structural valve deterioration. And if you go to valve failure defined as severe structural valve deterioration, valve re-intervention of valve-related death according to the European consensus statement and apply that to the notion trial, we see at eight years, it's numerical but non-significant difference uh, between these two, 10% for the surgical cohort and lower 7% for the TAVI cohort treated with the core valve platform. And once again, SAPEN platform provide the opposite outcome, higher rate of failure, almost 5% at five years compared to 1% in the surgical cohort. So just to conclude, durability of these fibrostatic aortic valve is important, particularly as we're going to expand to patients with longer life expectancy. And we have seen that Self-expanding transcatheter heart valves, such as the core valve platform, offer the largest opening area and the lowest transvalvular gradient. And this may transform into a lower rate of structural valve deterioration and valve failure as compared to both balloon expandable valve and surgical vibrostatic aortic valves. And similar, the lower rate of severe patient prestige mismatch with the self-expanding technology may improve the survival rate for these patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for nice uh, presentation. Um, actually, I think that the notion trial is uh, some kind of landmark trial uh, in the history of uh, uh, TABI, TABA uh, research. So the, uh, I'm very glad to have a, a lecture from Ralph. He's a center person in the, this very important trial. 
And Russ first summarized the ACCHA uh, 2020 guidelines. Uh, and uh, after this guideline, the 65 years old uh, became the, the threshold for the decision between Taba and Saba. So, and uh, PPM is uh, considered uh, severe if it is less than 0 0.85 and increased mortality significantly. Looking at uh, pattern three and the evolute low risk trials, instance of PPM is similar for balloon expandable, Taba and Saba, but much, much better in uh, self-expandable and super annular valve uh, implantation. And the notions trial showed eight years uh, structural valve uh, deterioration in 28.5% um, uh, after SABA compared to the 14.1% after uh, evolute uh, core valve implantation. It's much better. In terms of the uh, bioprostatic uh, valve uh, failure, BVD, TABA showed 7.3% compared to the 10.6% after SABA at five, eight years. So the, uh, it clearly shows the efficacy of the uh, self-expandable supra-annular TABI device, core valve evolute compared to the surgical valve implantation or balloon expandable valve implantation. So, Russ, could you tell the, uh, how much leaflet thrombosis contributes to structural valve deterioration? Mm. When you talk about valve thrombosis, I think it's very important to distinguish between two different phenomena. There's what we call clinical valve thrombosis, where you have a clear raise in transvalvular gradient, and often also the patient has sy symptoms. And we know that that can be resolved if we start anticoagulation therapy for this patient. This is quite rare. It's to report to be about 0.5 to 2% of the patient who face that. So a rare complication. Uh, and and I, we haven't seen any data comparing different platforms whether there's a difference between that. The other and much more common phenomenon is what we call subclinical leaflet thrombosis, which is something which yeah. is picked up on, on CT scan. It's also going to result on anticoagulation. But today, we don't know whether there's any clinical impact for the patient. Is it going to increase the risk of stroke or TIA? Is it going to increase the risk to further degeneration into clinical valve thrombosis? Or is it going to affect the durability? So for the time being, there's no evidence that we should actually look for this phenomenon or if we see it to treat it. And that's a much more common phenomenon. And it's the, the platform with the lowest incidence of subclinical leaflet thrombosis are the self-expanding technology with a super annular leaflet position compared to internal leaflet position. But again, because it's about uh, interpreting these data, because still we don't know whether it's going to have any clinical impact, this subclinical leaflet thrombosis. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So the uh, uh, Shinichi, uh, do you have uh, any recommendation for the, uh, you know, uh, CT examination or, uh, uh, or something uh, when you have uh, some doubt of the leaflet thrombosis? Yes. So uh, maybe uh, in our institution, the the, the uh, tabla procedure ju uh, the, uh, uh, just after tabla procedures, uh, the uh, post day one or day two, uh, uh, we take a CT scan uh, in order to uh, in order to, to detect the valvular thrombosis just after the procedures. And uh, uh, six months later, uh, most of uh, we will check the uh, mean pressure gradient and the 
uh, e even the even the e the elevation of the I mean pressure gradient only uh, five uh, millimeter mercuries. We will check the e e e the e c we will check the CT scan in order to detect the e valvular thrombosis because uh, in some patient uh, and, uh, uh, go the the patient with valvular thrombosis uh, getting uh, will get uh, the, get the uh, symptoms so. Uh, and uh, just after uh, uh, the the, uh, the valvular thrombosis uh, was detected, and uh, uh, well, uh, 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 check the patient uh, more uh, uh, short terms, uh, and check and check the symptoms, and uh, the, if the symptoms occur, they will prescribe. Uh, the anticoagulations. So first, he, uh, of course, the symptom is the uh, most important symptoms and uh, uh, new onset of the uh, systolic murmur, something. And then you are sending the patient to the uh, echo TTE and uh, still uh, you have some doubt about the reflex thrombosis. You are sending the patient to the CT scan, correct? That is a yeah. scenario. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, at this moment, uh, which do you start between the BKA or uh, NOAC? Mm, uh, maybe usually we prescribe the uh, BKA because uh, the uh, some patients have uh, variable thrombosis in spite of prescribing the DOWORK. Uh, so maybe the maybe I think uh, this I think uh, uh, VKA is uh, 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 only uh, uh, sorry DOAC is not for uh, covered by DOAC is not insurance. Uh, covered by insurance not yet okay. in Japan. Okay. Okay. I think uh, the you know the. Uh, Coronary access should be very important, especially in the patient who uh, lives longer after the TAVA implantation. The patient may, may develop a new coronary heart disease or exacerbation of the coronary heart disease. In that case, the coronary access should be very uh, important issue. And Tomoki, he's a chat, uh, uh, chat master, he uh, published the very important article uh, discussing about the uh, coronary accessibility after TAVA procedure according to the each valve system. Tomoki, I, can you have any comment or not? I don't know the situation. No? Okay, the Roy. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, Professor Soto, if we can bring him on, but I can certainly comment. And um, we have yes, done please. some teaching videos um, in our centre to to try and uh, make something that I think some sometimes people make more of it than it really is. And I think in terms of us as interventionalists trying to reaccess the coronaries, we often talk about trying to get commissural alignment and specifically talk about the left main stem, but, of course, it's not the left main that if there is any challenge, it will be the right coronary artery. And I think and often it's more about an understanding of where the neocommissures are and then how to actually talk the right coronary catheter and use some other techniques like using a, a guide catheter extension like a telescope um, to access yes. a coronary artery rather than uh, saying, look, we're not able to access the coronaries. In fact, it's actually very rare after any of the valve platforms not to be able to access the coronaries for angiography or PCI. Um, it's a different topic, of course, to talk about whether if we are going to do TAVA in TAVA, that for super, uh, superannular valves could potentially be challenging and that's something that if patients have coronary disease um, in very small anatomy needs to be proceeded with caution. Yes, we have the same uh, idea and the same uh, consideration. The, uh, okay, 
I think uh, we have to move to the uh, some uh, to the uh, finish this discussion. Thank you very much for everybody, and uh, uh, I want to pick up key points to learn during this uh, session. The first, the superiority of balloon expandable tabba uh, device for low risk patients. It was uh, confirmed compared to the SABA. But it was uh, true in the during the first year. And then by two years, the superiority of the TABA device compared to SABA, if it is a balloon expandable bulb, is lost, disappear. The superiority of self-expandable supraanular tabat uh, bulb for low-risk patients is confirmed over SABA up to two years. And uh, there is no com com convergence. So it's not crossing. And SABA is superior to TABA for new pacemaker or new pacemaker implantation. But TABA is superior to SABA in terms of echo examination hemodynamics. And PPM is more frequent after SABA or balloon expandable TABA implantation than self-expandable supraanular TABA device. Bioprosthetic valve failure, BVF, is less frequent after self-expandable supraanular TABA device compared to SABA. And the durability of a bioprosthetic valve is important in patients with longer life expectancy, expectancy like uh, Asian people. And self-expandable THB offer largest effective orifice area and lowest gradient. This may result in lower structural valve deterioration compared to balloon expandable valves. And lower rates of PPM contributes to improved survival. And, uh, at the end, coronary access has to be considered and must be a very important issue, especially the, if the patient's life expectancy, expectancy is longer. And also, as Roy uh, pointed out, the, if the patient has a valve in valve procedure, it must be a very significant issue. Okay, uh, that is a key learning ish, uh, key learnings from my side. So the uh, I want to finish this nice sessions discussing about the uh, super anular self expandable Tava devices, and we understood the. Uh, very remarkable uh, result after the self-expandable supraanular tabba devices implantation compared to the, if the patient is low risk, the compared to the surgical valve replacement and also the compared to the balloon expandable valve implantation. And uh, uh, we can, we introduce the uh, uh, cusp overlap view recently. So the, uh, because of uh, that technique, the, uh, the result was much improved. So still it means we have uh, some rule, rooms for the improvement. Anyway, uh, thanks very much to the uh, Roy and Russ 
and Shinichi for your nice presentation and the nice discussion. Thank you very much. I want to finish this session. Thank you. Thank you.